Welcome to my channel. My name is Benjamin Berger, and this video is in response to a comment that I got from someone with an awesome online moniker of Magnificent Fungazoids. They noticed that on my video on carnivores and creodonts, I had mentioned that creodonts had succumbed to extinction during the Eocene Oligocene transition, while the carnivora continued into the Neogene period of the Cenozoic to evolve into the cats, dogs, bears, hyenas, lions, sea lions, seals, foxes, badgers, weasels, and skunks that live today. While the Eocene-Oligocene boundary represents a major change in the diversity of carnivorous mammals, it did not completely wipe off the Hynodontidae family of creodonts. So today I thought I would talk about the post-Eocene fossils of the creodont family Hynodontidae, nowadays placed in its own order, the Hynodonta, that survived into the Oligocene and Miocene, and how and where they did it. The Eocene-Oligocene boundary for many, many years was poorly defined. Beds as old as 40 million years old were often lumped into the Oligocene, and it wasn't until about 25 years ago that the boundary was finally constrained to something approaching its current acceptable date in 2018 of 33.8 million years ago, which means that fossils found in the currently defined uh, late Eocene were often reported in the older papers and articles as being found in the Oligocene. The famous mammalian paleontologist Donald Prothrow figured out this timing issue in the 1990s and published a number of books on his study of the Eocene-Oligocene boundary. In North America, the only creodont that crosses this younger boundary was the late Eocene genus Hyenodon, a hyena-like creodont that lived in the central plains of Nebraska and South Dakota, which is found in the overlying lower scenic member of the Brule Formation, extending into the early Oligocene layer of rock, which is dated to around 33.3 million years ago. So, in North America, Hyenodon did extend slightly into the Oligocene, but as a group they were nearing extinction. A similar pattern is observed in Europe and Asia, where creodonts were losing out in diversity to true carnivora. However, there was one place that hyenodonted creodonts were able to survive during this period of time. Africa. During the early Cenozoic with the extinction of dinosaurs until the late Eocene, Africa was an isolated continent separated from Europe and Asia by a major seaway called the Tethys Seaway that extended across the Middle East. As an isolated continent, Africa exhibited a unique mammalian fauna during this time, much like Australia and South America exhibit unique mammalian faunas of diverse marsupials in their histories, Africa during the early Cenozoic was also unique in its mammalian fauna because of this isolation. The continent contained the Afrotheres, a group of living and extinct mammals that include elephants, hyraxes, elephant shrews, and tenrex, as well as fossils like embryothropods, like a cenotherium. These mammals were very diverse, with deer-like hyraxes that filled many of the niches occupied by other groups in Europe, Asia, and North America. Four groups had made it across the seaway during the Eocene. Artiodactyls had made the trip with a group called the Anthracotheres, which are possibly ancestral to hippos or hippopotamus. The primates were also well established in Africa, with a fossil record beginning in the Paleocene. And rodents appear in the Eocene with a very endemic group called the Phamyid rodents, a stricter morph group of rodents that are re relatives of today's cane rats and naked mole rats. Interestingly, Africa lacked parasodactyls, the group that includes rhinos, tapirs, titanotheres, and horses, which were extremely diverse in Asia and North America during the Eocene. It also lacked many mammals we associate with Africa, like giraffes, bovids, lions, jackals, and hyenas, which arose in Europe. 
As for carnivorous mammals, in Australia and South America, marsupials were the group that evolved to fill the carnivorous niches during the Eocene, while in Africa, it was a unique group of creedonts. One of the most famous fossil localities in the late Eocene of Africa is L41. Located in the Fayum Depression of Egypt, it's an amazing fossil locality that I was lucky enough to work in 20 years ago under an expedition led by Owen Simons and a crew from the Egyptian Geological Survey in Duke University. The L41 quarry has produced a number of small bodied creodonts that closely resemble early, smaller hyenodonted creodonts from North America and Europe during the Eocene epoch. However, the age of this fossil quarry sits right at the Eocene Oligocene boundary, with the estimated date of 33 million years ago, correlated using the paleomagnetic record to Cron 13. This layer of rocks, called the Jebekotwani Formation in Egypt, spans the Eocene Oligocene boundary, and creodonts are found straight through it, showing no evidence for an extinction. These small bodied African creodonts are unrelated to the North American and Asian genus Hyenodon from the late Eocene and earliest Oligocene, but an off branch related to the small dog sized Tritemnodon from the Middle Eocene. So it appears that creodonts were able to make it in Africa during the Paleocene and early Eocene and fill the carnivorous niche in isolation from the true carnivora, driving the marsupials to extinction. Collectively, these African creodonts are placed in their own superfamily, the, the High Nail Oridae and they were very successful during the late Eocene and into the Oligocene in Africa. The high nail oridae were an exception to the rule of extinction at the Eocene-Oligocene boundary, and they persisted well into the Miocene epoch about 22 million years ago. But the Eocene-Oligocene boundary affected their distribution as well. During the Eocene-Oligocene boundary event, South America pulled away from Antarctica, causing the development of the Trans-Antarctic Current, which dramatically cooled the ocean, which acted as a coolant for the entire planet. Sea level in the Tetha Seaway dropped as ice sheets formed near the poles, allowing these creodonts in Africa to migrate out of Africa into Europe, Asia, and onward even to Canada and northern North America in the late Eocene and into the Miocene. Another one of the groups that made this exodus from Africa were the ancestors to elephants and mammoths and mastodons, the proboscideans. Beginning in the late Eocene but continuing into the Miocene, various members of this group dispersed out of Africa. In Europe with Hyaliolorus, North America with Hemisaliodon, and in Asia with Aureus Pterodon. Other members like Pterodon also dispersed from Africa into Europe with an interchange of mammals near the Eocene Oligocene boundary. The arrival of true carnivorans or carnivora in Africa resulted in the surviving creodonts to become more and more specialized, either growing in size or shrinking in size to occupy new niches in the environment. Now for an extra adventure story. In 1966, the British paleontologist R.J.G. Savage traveled by helicopter across the deserts of Libya, south of Benghazi. Oil workers from the Esso Standard and Oasis Oil Company had reported finding fossils in the desert in the oil fields on, on well pads. He was flown out into the desert to see if he could collect some of these fossils for the British Museum. And during the trip, he found a massively large skull of a creodont in beds estimated to be early Miocene in age. This animal was named Megistotherium, and it was about the 
the one of the last and largest creodonts to have ever lived. Its skull measured 66.4 centimeters in length and 27.1 centimeters in width, about twice the size of a grizzly bear. It was a big animal, but few additional, more fragmentary fossils of this fossil have been found since then in Tunisia and Egypt and Pakistan. But with the Libyan revolution in 1969, the fossil sites in Libya were never revisited, and even today, much of the fossils in the Libyan desert are poorly studied. Magistotherium was featured in R.J.G. Savage's excellent book, Mammalian Evolution, An Illustrated Guide, and today has become legendary on the internet, well drawn by artists and even been featured in video games. Its large size has made it famous. I hope this rectifies my mistake, and if you notice any other mistakes I make, let me know in the comments below. I hope that you enjoy these weekly videos. I want to thank my supporters on Patreon, Brian Clever, Alejandro Marces, um, Arctotis1811, Justin Bovey, Pablo Luzato Figuez, and all of my Trilobite supporters for keeping these videos coming and making them freely available on YouTube and encourage me to make more of them. If you'd like to support these videos, check out the link below. Thank you.